Deanna and the Buffs start their season tonight. It has to get better, right? Are the 49ers still a contender with all their contract issues? And what's more impressive, a doggy first pitch or a human home run? Either way, those Otanis are some good boys. It's the last show of the week right here on Around the Horn. Let's go. My dog is so rich. Jacobin is a great name. We say it in full here in Los Angeles. My dog would never. I would have never found my dog. It's year two of the Deion Sanders era at Colorado, beginning tonight against FCS powerhouse North Dakota State. The Bison are the number two team in the FCS coaches poll and had a six year stretch where it registered six straight wins over FBS opponents. On the flip side, Colorado makes its return to the Big 12 after a 4-8 finish and a roster that is hardly recognizable after 61% of the high school recruits and transfers that signed with the Buffs in 2023, they're no longer on the roster. All while Sanders' squad boasts two of the nation's top players in Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter. Many questions, though, remain. Clinton, around the horn to you. How much scrutiny will Colorado be under this season, and how much more do the results matter in year two? I think quite a bit, but I think this is a two-part discussion. As you all know, I've spent a lot of time in Boulder, and so what I'm saying that for is because the cultural impact of Deion Sanders has already been had. It's not going to change. You've got billboards in Times Square with your players on them. People know who the Buffaloes are now. From a football standpoint, however, NDSU is no slouch. they got a first-year coach, but a fifth-year quarterback. They're a run-heavy team. This would not be some monster upset, in my opinion, if they beat the Buffaloes. This is also at home for Colorado. The football matter here is huge. Because you have to look at yourself and say, how much better is this team than it was last year, if at all? And this is a great test. And people looking, saying, I don't care about anything other than results. This game is the most important game for Deion Sanders' Colorado career happening tonight. All the other stuff, the good things he's done, putting money in dad's bank accounts, but the questionable stuff, hiring guys like Warren Sapp, the journalistic ethics situation, that's all separate from now. Tonight is the game that matters for the Buffalo. Yeah, a lot of off-field and rather storylines that were self-created by Deion on Sanders in Colorado this offseason. But as we turn to football tonight, Emily, as you size up these expectations for a team that has the 13th hardest strength of schedule, how do you see Colorado in year two? I know this is crazy to say for a sports show where we should care about results, but I don't know if the results actually matter for Deion Sanders. I mean, he only needed four wins to be the Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year. When they went through that slide, when they lost all those games at the end of the year, did you hear any pushback from his university president, from his athletic director, his bosses? No, they were super happy because enrollment is up, Kids want to come and transfer there. Money and publicity are following. And I think that he's going to continue that no matter what they do on the field this year because he has found a way to connect with this younger generation of players that a lot of coaches have not been able to do. And at the end of the day, college football is a business. He's bringing in money, and that's what matters to Colorado right now. Justin Tinsley, how do you see year two? Emily says that expectations, the wins, that stuff doesn't matter because Dion brings the viewership anyways. But this is a Colorado team that has not had a six win season since 2016 yeah I think this season for success they have to flip their record from last year they went four and eight last year I think success is eight and four because now they have to walk it like they talk it we talk about the culture change at Colorado well culture has to match the success on the field and we talked about their offseason which was really turbulent at times but people want to know, is this a better team than last year? Shador Sanders got sacked more than any quarterback in North America last year. So what did Colorado do? They replaced the entire starting offensive line. People, pe people want to look at the defensive line last year, which was some mid for, for the great majority of the season. And so that's what people are looking at. They had eight losses last year, six by one possession. Can they actually close a game this year? So tonight is a really good test against a really good North Dakota State team. And in fact, according to ESPN Bet, 76% of the straight-up bets are on North Dakota State. So there's a lot of pressure on this game tonight for Dion and, and, and for Colorado as a whole. All right, you heard him there, Pablo Torre. How do you see what's at stake for Dion Sanders in Colorado in year two? Yeah, look, I was listening to what Emily was saying, and I think there's some truth to that insofar as, of course, we live in the attention economy now. This is the NIL economy, an economy where image and marketing, which Dion is unparalleled at, in college sports, I would argue, can really create real money, 
And the question that I have is whether it will lead to real results. And this is where I think this game would be so enormously humiliating if they were to lose to a team that, as Clinton points out, is actually a giant killer, right? North Dakota State should not be underrated, but at the same time, if Dion loses with a team made in his image, meant to monetize his image, to a 1AA team, as we used to call him back in my day, that is so unbelievably shameful. And so my optimism here and my pessimism is kind of one and the same. It's that an attention economy can be curved by the reality that in sports, the results have to be delivered. And Dion might be able to sell image, but if he goes and struggles again, it should be a real, real crisis in which you have to ask, is this actually somebody who can do this at Colorado? So far, the answer is no. All right, Clinton, you late. Clinton Yates, last word to you. I will give Dion credit for this. Scheduling this game was half the battle in terms of bravery to prove that his team was any good. We're looking at two polar opposites here. NDSU won 11 games last year. Colorado only even played in 12. So cohesive unit versus constant sliding doors. We'll see what college football has to offer in terms of both. You heard our first horn. We now move on to the NFL. The 49ers' Brandon Ayuk stalemate took a dramatic twist Wednesday as Ayuk was cleared by team doctors after he was said to have back and neck issues in training camp, according to ESPN's Nick Wagner. Niners GM John Lynch said he expected Ayuk to practice, quote, at some point, you've got to play. A team clearly growing impatient with the receiver's hold-in, which continued at today's practice. Meanwhile, star offensive lineman Trent Williams is holding out. We've seen this from him before, and of course, superstar running back Christian McCaffrey is dealing with a calf injury. Justin Tinsley, this is a team that many have already slated into the Super Bowl. A lot of issues here. Which is the biggest for the 49ers right now? Honestly, Courtney, that is an almost impossible question to answer because I don't think there is a wrong answer. But if I have to choose one, I'm taking IU. This is a guy who had 1,300 yards last year for the 49ers, above and beyond their best wide receiver. And he hasn't even, you know, put on pads this summer. He hadn't played in a preseason game. But when you look at Trent Williams, the the best pass blocking tackle in the league, it, you got to get that contract done. And when you look at Christian McCaffrey, the best running back in the league, and you, do, you don't know his long-term availability. And guess what? All this is happening right before season when Brock Purdy, he's looking at a potential $300 million contract next summer. So if I'm a 49ers fan, I'm very, I'm very concerned. And that light at the end of the tunnel doesn't always mean glory. It may be the end is near. I'm not saying that it is, uh, but I would be very concerned. So this team has been so close so many times, but uh, th they're entering this season with far more questions than answers. I appreciate you laying forth the situation and detailing every little issue that's going on with this team, but you got to pick one. What is the biggest issue of all of those that you just laid out? Ayuk, you lose 1,300 yards in your receiving court, you're going to feel that. There we go. The answer that I was looking for. Pablo Torre do you feel like the gloves might be off here a little bit between the 49ers saying, well, he's medically cleared to practice. They have the right to find him. Yeah, oh, they're setting the stage for uh, conflicting claims over what is fair. And the Niners know what they're doing. By the way, we're at this phase of a hold in, which is just a funny concept of I'm going to show up to work but not do anything you want me to do. Um, it's a hold in because everybody's saber rattling. They're trying to say this is what it looks like when the games actually count. This is what it could be like for you. So yeah, they're preparing for, for a real ugly battle. But my answer for this reason is the literal biggest problem, which is Trent Williams not playing. This is the best offensive lineman. This is the key to everybody that we've mentioned. All the skill players, by the way, Christian McCaffrey included, who is currently dealing with a mysterious ailment, which we can only chalk up to, I guess, Christian McCaffrey-ness. This kind of happens to him. But I would like Trent Williams to help that guy's life get easier. I'd like Trent Williams to protect the 300 and some odd million dollar man in Brock Purdy that Justin alluded to, which in two years is the reason why everybody's looking at this pot of money and saying, it's time for me to rattle my saber right now. But for the present tense, Trent Williams not playing in a regular season game is the biggest nightmare for me as a Niner fan of the options presented. Clinton Yates, what is the biggest issue with the San Francisco 49ers? We can talk about this conceptually, or I can give a nod to our friends at the sports information group that we have here. Since 2020, when Ayuk and Williams were both acquired, both came to the 49ers, they played about 3,100 snaps. 300 of those have been without both Williams and Ayuk. In those 300 snaps, Q 
QBR is down by 30 points and they are averaging 2.1 less yards per play. They are just plain not as good of a team without both of those guys there and if you're a 49ers fan or if you're even in their front office you have to be looking at that and saying I'm sorry the fairness is one thing the production is another the numbers are right there this is bad news if Williams and I you cannot get back on the field for that. that was a whole lot of numbers Emily Kaplan can you simplify this for me for a team that we talk about the Super Bowl window closing on if they don't get these issues resolved meaning no Trent Williams no Brandon Ayuk we know that even Elijah Mitchell a backup running back just put on IR the other day on top of Christian McCaffrey. Are they a Super Bowl team if they don't get any of those figured out? Courtney, I love that you come to me. You're like, come on, please do football for dummies. And I will try to do that and explain this in the most <laughs> layman's terms. Um, Brandon Ayuk is the least of their issues because I think that he completely misplayed his hand. He went out and he sought leverage and he got a couple other teams to, you know, negotiate and drum up some interest. And then where did it land him exactly here? I think that he is completely backed into a corner and that there's nothing that he personally can do. I think for this season, Christian McCaffrey is the biggest issue because we know that if Christian McCaffrey doesn't play, it diametrically changes the complexion of what this offense looks like. And this offense is so good. And then big picture, the guys are mentioning it, but Brock Purdy, I mean, he's just making over a million dollars this year for the first time. That's the reason when a guy's on his rookie contract, you're able to do all these things and why you're so hesitant to pay the guys that do deserve more money because you're trying to save up for him. And our buddy Bill Barnwell is the one that said he could make as much as $60 million in his next deal. Okay, so that's next summer and then you have to spend that. They're not going to be the presumed Super Bowl favorites when you're allotting that much money to Brock Purdy. There's the old adage in the NFL that it is a win now league. Worry about tomorrow's decisions next year. However, a lot of tomorrow's decisions are ones that are currently on the table and plaguing the San Francisco 49ers as we are less than two weeks away from the regular season starting. There is your horn. Here is your break by yourself. Coming up next. A self-admitted foot and mouth moment by Bengals coach Zach Taylor. One day after Taylor said the plan is for Jamar Chase to practice moving forward, the star receiver showed up to Cincinnati's Wednesday's practice in street clothes, and he was back on the sideline. Same DNP at today's practice as well. Clinton, Bengals owner Mike Brown doesn't usually deal with contracts during the season, so with week one, one week out, how do you figure this out? What are you buying? What are you selling? Look, I'm never buying anything that Bengals ownerships or front offices are doing. I went to college outside of Cincinnati. We know how they roll on the cheapness. Sign this guy. There's Burrow and there's him. That's all that matters. But there's a reason why this team is nicknamed locally the Bungles. I mean, I might call them the Cheapinati Bengals at this point, Emily Kaplan. <laughs> Even better. Yeah, just to further Clinton's point, I mean, there's been two seasons where Jamar Chase and uh, Joe Burrow have been healthy for the whole year. One year they went to a conference championship, the other the Super Bowl. We know this franchise is frugal, but they did change their ways for Joe Burrow. You have to realize though, it's not just the quarterback, it's the pieces around him. They should pay him and play him the season. And that happened last year on the eve of the season starting, right? As the Kansas City Chiefs and Detroit Lions were about to start, there comes the Joe Burrow deal, Justin Tinsley. Could it happen with Jamar Chase the same way? I really, really hope so, because since he is playing with fire, Chase is one of four, four receivers in NFL his, history with 80 catches and 1,000 yards in each of his first three seasons. You don't mess around with that production. You don't mess around with that chemistry with Joe Burrow. And right now, it's a lot of messing around with a man who is really about his business and wants his coins. Pay him his money. That is what Justin Tinsley is saying. Yes. Even though he's got two years mm -hmm. left on his contract, Pablo Torre, do you think the Bengals will? I think they will because, look, Joe Burrow's stated philosophy has been bleep it, Jamar down there somewhere. And ensuring that Jamar is down there somewhere is very important. The problem, Courtney, of course, is that at LSU, for one season, Jamar was not down there. Jamar Chase knows how to create value, and it's by sitting out games. That's how you build leverage. And so I believe the threat is real. I believe that Joe Burrow is going to want to make this happen and fight behind the scenes. I think they'll ultimately give him what he does want and deserve. Speaking of the bank. That at LSU, for one season, Jamar was not down there. Jamar Chase knows how to create value, and it's by sitting out games. 
That's how you build leverage. And so I believe the threat is real. I believe that Joe Burrow is going to want to make this happen and fight behind the scenes. I think they'll ultimately give him what he does want and deserve. Speaking of the Bengals, the team that faces them in week one is the New England Patriots. Jacoby Brissett will be QB1 for this offense is so bad. I mean, Nick Haley chose to keep a positional coaching job rather than take the OC job. Their offensive line is not good. It's currently banged up. Putting your rookie out there is feeding him to the wolves. This is why you signed Jacoby Brissett to a one-year deal. Justin Tinsley, how do you see this decision? Yeah, I totally agree. They have the hardest strength of schedule in the league. The offensive line is a mess. That receiving core scares no one. But look, Drake May will start at some point this season, but who will be out there with them? I'm in 100% agreement with Gerard Mayo on this decision. Pablo Torre? Yeah, Jacoby Brissett understands that he is being cast for a certain role in a horror movie. You know what's gonna happen to this dude. It's happened to dudes like this for a very long time in this particular sort of a role. And so of course, this is a uh, fundamentally haunted house of a franchise right now. You don't wanna be him, but the job for now is to be the guy that gets, you know, taken out to get the, the star up front in front of the He's game. already been taken out by that offensive line. One time, I can only imagine by week seven or whenever yes. that Jets game is, Clinton Yates, how uh, how Jacoby Brissett's going to be feeling. How do you view this situation and the decision that Gerard Mayo came to? Pablo skating on very thin ice there. Looks like I am going to be the one eliminated from this show first. But anyway, what I'm buying is Mayo <laughs> being actually open and honest about the quarterback situation from the Patriots all these years. We've seen all this goofiness from Belichick. We're on to Cincinnati. You never really know what's going on. He spoke the truth and made the right decision. Nothing like somebody being straightforward in an NFL circumstance. Florida State, Georgia Tech was the appetizer to college football this season. And this weekend, we have a whole buffet of high-profile games as week one kicks off. This week features a matchup between the only active coaches with multiple national titles when Clemson plays Georgia in Atlanta. New Texas A&M coach Mike Elko facing his former quarterback Riley Leonard when Notre Dame and college game day come to town. And local Morgantown schools canceling classes over anticipated traffic ahead of West Virginia's game against Emily's Penn State. Also Miami at Florida Man and USC and LSU meet in Vegas, baby. Clinton, which week one one matchup are you most locked in on? To me, it's Notre Dame, Texas A&M, and not just because today's ESPN Daily episode is all about the history of that little rivalry, but because both of these teams are in kind of interesting Mm. transitional situations. The third year for a Notre Dame head coach is when those boosters expect it to happen. And on top of that, Marcus Freeman is the most handsome man in the country, so I'll watch every game that Notre Dame plays. Come on now, what are we doing? Penn State alum Emily Kaplan, are you taking the game that I put on the menu, or are you going somewhere else? I'm not the one that's obsessed with Penn State. West Virginia is the one that's canceling classes, and Pat McAfee, their alum, saying it's the biggest game in decades. I thought you guys were once a proud institution for football. I digress. Uh, This year, it's finally open for Penn State to make the college football playoffs now that it's expanded. We have a new offensive coordinator, Andy Kultonicki, and we, I didn't know you were on the team, Emily Kaplan, Justin Tinsley. (laughs) (laughs) Which game are you looking at? I'm actually going to go off menu. Boston College, uh, Florida State. Boston, Co- Boston College has one of the most underrated players in the country and quarterback, Thomas Castellanos. But listen, if Florida State goes 0-2 in the ACC, you might as well cancel Christmas. The season is over, and that's not an exaggeration. And Pablo Torre, week one. No, it's Miami at Florida. Oh, sorry, Courtney, not to jump the, jump the gun here, but to me, Miami at Florida is the NIL Collective Bowl. It is a rivalry premised on a lawsuit that's actively being pursued against Billy Napier by Jaden Rashada, who plays for Georgia. And what is more Florida than dysfunction that you're blaming on somebody else? It's great. It's perfect. I want to see. Pablo predicted this thing perfectly. Goodbye, Clinton Yates. You are the first eliminated. Goodbye, Emily Kaplan. You know how it goes in horror movies. Cut is always the deepest, but there's your showdown. Good. Justin Tinsley, Pablo Torre coming up next. The Indiana Fever took down the Connecticut Sun 84-80 on a night where Caitlin Clark again made WNBA rookie history by setting the new three-point record at 88. Indiana moved to 15-16 and 16 after starting the season 1-8. Justin, who or what has impressed you most about this run? The way this team has gelled. Since June 10th, they're the third best team in the league. Caitlin Clark has matured into her role. Aaliyah Boston is the enforcer on that team. Kelsey Mitchell, 20 points in five straight games. They are continuing to gel, and it's one of the best things to watch in sports. 
No, the supporting cast has been excellent, but they are the supporting cast. I mean, I want to be clear about the engine of this car. It is Caitlin Clark, who set the rookie assist record last week. Of course, the three-point record for a rookie last night. So to me, it's just mind-blowing how good this team has been, 4-1 and one in the last five since the Olympic break, because she got some rest, finally, Caitlin did. So <laughs> I pick her. The team versus the individual accomplishment. Both are correct. Both get a point. Moving on, on Shohei and Decoy Otani bobblehead night, an estimated 20,000 fans were in line four hours before first pitch. Decoy, Otani's dog, threw out the cer ceremonial first pitch before watching his dad crush a leadoff homer and later at a pair of stolen bases en route to a 6-4 win. Pablo, who performed better on their shared bobblehead night? Shohei or the pup? It has to be the pup. I've seen a lot of people try first pitches. Some friends, some panelists even, <coughs> <Ina Kimes. coughs> uh, throw a first pitch <laughs> from the front of the mound. And I just want to say to Decoy Otani, you threw it from the rubber. You towed hey, the rubber me, and you threw it you, from there. Incredibly getting, impressive. Let me tell you, getting the dog to understand the assignment in front of thousands of people is damn near impossible. So shout out to Decoy, because if that was my dog, Nipsey, he would have peed on third base, pooped in left field, and jumped over the center field wall. It would have been a disaster. Shohei Otani apparently training his dog and uh, somehow finding the time to be one of the greatest <laughs> baseball players ever. Uh, go ahead and take the face time, also, Justin Tinsley. <laughs> This has been a major week in the Tinsley household. My son started school this week. He's only 19 months, but he started school. No meltdowns, no bitings. He's having fun outside. Huey, dad loves you. Mom loves you. Veda loves you. I can't wait to see you when I get home and give you a hug. Most importantly, but give you a bath. Love you, man. 19 months old and he's already in school. He is a prodigy. We are on a 119 and a half hour break. Tony is on, back court. on Tuesday. Go, I go back into the wall. 